So if you were wondering why Mr. Suasuna decides to go to Sao Paulo, it's actually because he got into a fight with somebody. So in 1965, Mr. Suasuna decides to go to um, Sao Paulo. The reason he does this, by the way, is because he gets into a fight with somebody. He, he gets into a fight with a guy who wouldn't pay a kid who was selling, you know, little trinkets on the street his money. So the guy steals the kid's stuff and doesn't want to pay him anything. And so Mr. Sosuna, feeling bad because he was in the little kid's situation at one point, he goes, he follows the guy, and he beats the crap out of him. He beats the crap out of him. And apparently this is some important person, somebody he shouldn't have beaten up, and it forces him to feel like, oh crap, I gotta get out of here. So he leaves Bahia, and he leaves basically the next day without much preparation or anything, and he leaves to Sao Paulo. So in 1965, as I covered in the last section, Mr. Susuna decides to fly off, or rather, take a bus, to Sao Paulo. He leaves the state of Bahia and he goes off to Sao Paulo like many Brazilians uh, in northern Brazil did at the time. A lot of them were looking for work. They would come down in the thousands from northern Brazil to places like Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, Brasilia as well. All of them looking for work, all of them looking for opportunity, the same way people look for opportunities coming to the US, for example. And Mr. Sosuna was no different. He came over to Sao Paulo looking for work and he had a rough time actually. He came to the bus terminal looking for a friend, looking for an acquaintance that he had from Bahia and hoping that he would kind of magically find him. So he was essentially just stuck for a while. And it's really crazy to hear about his time there arriving at Sao Paulo. He was essentially homeless for a long time and he really didn't have anyone to help him out. He was by himself, he had very little food, he had no way of really making money. And he talks about how he would just kind of sleep in the cold. And in Sao Paulo, it's significantly colder than in Bahia. Now, Brazilian cold is not the same as American or European cold, but it's still cold to be on the floor. And so that was the situation that Mr. Suasuna found himself in. He was cold, he was hungry, he was losing weight, and he was really desperate. And he talks about how, you know, he would cry and he was just sad. And I can't even imagine what he must have been feeling. The man was about, you know, 25, 26. Uh, moving to Sao Paulo looking for opportunities and it looks like it's crushed before it even starts. Mr. Sosuna does find the person that he was looking for this whole time. He was walking around in a park. It seemed like he was just kind of there aimlessly and he sees his friend out in the distance. He goes like, oh my God, it's you. And he finds his friend and he's excited because he's like almost dying. He's so hungry, right? So he finds his friend and his friend takes him in and I should be really loose, I'm using the word friend really loosely. Um, this seems like it was kind of like a loose connection that he had and he kind of went out on a limb and just hoped and prayed that this person would help him out. But anyways, it works out. His uh, friend helps him out, he helps him get a job, um, he helps house him for a little while and, and during this time Mr. Susun is basically working, he's training. The second chapter essentially ends with him finding his first student, Armando. And this person is pretty significant because just like uh, his friend that he found in Sao Paulo, Armando is someone who really helped him out in the beginning parts of his uh, life in Sao Paulo. He helped him uh, get a job, he helped him, uh, you know, get basically settled in Sao Paulo. But the way they met was actually a really cool story. Mestre Suasuna is selling books door to door, door to door salesman. And he decides, okay, I'm gonna go to this person and he starts selling the books. And he notices that the person has a beaten bow in their house. And when he sees that, he says, oh, I teach capoeira, who here plays a beating bow? And the person in the house says, oh, uh, this is Armando's beating bow. Um, you do capoeira, that's really cool. You should wait for him. Wait for him and uh, you guys can talk. So he waits for Armando to get back and Armando shows up and Mr. Suasuna shows him what he can do. He throws mea lua, he does awu, he does makaku, he does all these cool things. And Armando's like, oh my God, this guy's so amazing. 
you have to stay here and you know stay here have dinner with us so just stay overnight we'll talk and stuff we'll become friends basically and it's kind of crazy how that sort of thing happened but Armando was Mester Suasuna's first student in Sao Paulo and uh, he helped him out a lot and I like this chapter because it shows how um, everybody needs a friend basically you know everybody needs a leg up you can't do everything on your own and Mr. Suasuna as big as he is is no different he needed people to help him out in those beginning days and Armandu is one person who did that and played a big role his friend um, who he knew from Bahia played another huge role in getting him over there and you can even say that the guy that he beat up played a role as well because that was the impetus for him to even go to Sao Paulo in the first place so he goes and he starts Capoeira Cordão de Ouro from there that's a little later in the story more in chapter 4 to be honest so we still have to get through chapter 3 and chapter 3 really talks about how he starts teaching and how he gets acquainted with the Capoeira community there all the people that you heard hear about Mr. Brasilia uh, people you don't know about, Mr. Zid Freitas, and, and others who were involved in the community in Sao Paulo at the time, the growing capoeira scene. So here we go, chapter three. And in the second chapter, we kind of left off talking about how Mr. Bimba actually gets to Sao Paulo, but here we're going to talk a little bit more about how he associates with the capoeiristas who are already there. So after a little while, Mestre Suasuna begins training and becoming friends with many of the people from Acresp. Academia de Capoeira Regional de Elite de São Paulo, Acresp. And Acresp is run by Mestre Zedi Freitas. Now, people either knew Mestre Zedi Freitas or they knew Mestre Valdemar dos Santos. It was either one of those two, and both were very pivotal people in creating the Capoeira community that existed in São Paulo. They both hosted training, uh, they both hosted rodas, and they had a network that people latched onto and kind of grew from there. So Mestre Suasuna was one of those people. He became good friends with Mestre Pinacci, one of the founding people of Acresp. And Mestre Pinacci actually helped Mestre Suasuna get a job at a bank. He got him a good job, which is awesome. And he also became good friends with them. So Mestre Suasuna became good friends with Mestre Zedi Freitas and uh, other students and teachers who were in that circle as well. These people would have hadas, um, they would have dinner together, they would eat together, and basically they were friends. And a lot of this chapter really is about that. It's, it's uh, about that small capoeira community, um, that small group of teachers coming together, building something together, doing shows together, and even creating an association together. This federation is called the Federação de Capoeira Paulista. And it's very pivotal, this foundation. It's so pivotal, in fact, that Mr. Bimba comes from Bahia. He comes over to Sao Paulo at the request of one of his students, and he actually recognizes this federation for the work that they've done uh, in spreading capoeira and creating interest in capoeira and all the amazing things that they've done thus far. So, Mestre Bima comes over in 1972, which is a pretty sig big deal, it's a pretty significant thing. He recognizes all these young masters, these young teachers for the work that they've done. And the teachers we're talking about are teachers like Mestre Suasuna, Mestre Brasilia, Mestre Joel, Mestre Zedi Freitas, Mestre Ma Valdemar dos Santos, Mestre Gilvan, Mestre Pinacci, and Mestre Bimba student, Mestre Arton Onsa. And these are very pivotal people in the world of Capoeira in Sao Paulo at that time. And so for Mestre Bimba to go over there to, you know, play music with them, to recognize them publicly is such a huge deal and it's probably a huge honor uh, to a fellow. I can't even imagine if you know, some great mestre at the time comes over to my school or to my friends, the people that I train with and try to build something with, comes over and says, hey, you guys are doing an amazing job. I just want to publicly congratulate for all of you, for all that you have done. So that must have been an amazing feeling and I can't even imagine what that's like. And it's, it's great that it happened because two years later, Mr. Bimbo actually passes away in 1974. So in 1972, it seems that uh, Mr. Suasuna and the other capoeiristas in Sao Paulo are really gaining some traction. And it's really the story of the 70s for capoeira because in 1970s, you have growth of capoeira in places like Europe, 
in California, in New York. You have people going all over the world starting capoeira schools. And it's really even the case for Mestre Suasuna in 1970. Mestre Suasuna and Mestre Brasilia, the founding members of Cordão de Ouro, have their first turma. And their first turma happens in 1970, and it all takes off from there. And so that's really what the fourth chapter is really about, the beginnings of CDO. CDO as a big movement coming together and doing big things. And that's something that I can't wait to talk about because that's kind of like the climax of this story. So I hope you can't wait to see that part because it's gonna be awesome. We're gonna be talking about people that we all know about now, big names that people associate with CDO, um, like Mestre Spihu Mirim, right? Mestre Kibi, etc. So we're gonna get to that in the next chapter. Um, but for now, I just wanted to explain a few little tidbits that I saw in this chapter that I thought were really awesome and I just wanted to share. Mestre Brasilia, for example, was a student of Mestre Gajikinha. Something I didn't know, but I thought was really cool. And it, it was nice to know that there was a connection there with Mestre Kajikinha. Um, I didn't know that really existed, but it just was something that I thought was neat and made me want to look up a little bit more about his history. Something that Mestre Bimba said when he was trying to get the hot, really fiery, really hot, uh, you know, people to play hard was, Esquento banho, esquento banho. Get the water, the bath water, hot. And what he meant by that is, you know, play hard. You shop a benção, martelo, whatever it is. Hasteras, uh, uh, you know, play hard. And that's what he would use to, to say that, which I thought was pretty cool. The last thing that I wanted to mention was something of an unintended consequence that I thought was really interesting. It was the depart departamento, or no, it was the federação Paulista de Capoeira. This organization, although it was great at the time and even Mestre Bimbo recognized them for their work, uh, Mestre Suasuna states how the emphasis eventually became more on the physicality of Capoeira, the sportness of it, the, uh, and even the violent uh, aspects of Capoeira. And so he became very disillusioned, it seems, with the organization and left eventually um, because it became part of a movement towards a more, I guess you could say, brutish form of Capoeira where you, you see a lot of Capoeira videos today, people just like beating the hell out of each other. And that seems to be a response to the Federación that was created in the early 1970s. So it's interesting to see how that happens, how that works. Um, it seems like a bit of an unfortunate thing that an organization like that kind of didn't jive too well with Mestre Sosuna, but eventually he went on to bigger and better things. Again, look forward to that. And if you want to help support this channel, it would be great if you can give me a thumbs up, a like, right? Subscribe and yeah, keep following the content. Share. Tell your friends about it. If uh, they don't have access to Mr. Susuna's biography, you know, let your friends know that they can tune into this uh, YouTube channel until they get their hands on it, okay? So thanks a lot, and I'll see you guys next time.